Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth, Sydney, June 19 to 20, 2024, and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslach and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10-year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, hand-picked case studies from organisations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Donlop on that High Court case which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. It's often easy to see the aspects of an organization that will cause physical harm, while situations where psychosocial harm could occur are a little bit more complicated. We'll talk about some of the unwritten rules that make organizations psychologically unsafe. Up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. As workplace mental health has become a global priority, there's a greater focus on addressing psychosocial hazards. Each episode, we look at psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective. Let's talk psych health and safety. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Each week, we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences, research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. So one of the most challenging concerns about psychological health and safety culture of organizations is the gap between what's advertised as the culture and what's publicized as the rules and the reality that people find out once they get inside the organization. Uh, Sometimes folks find out that the culture is not as advertised and sometimes it just really doesn't suit them. And uh, so honestly, I consider myself a rather average TikTok watcher, but I recently came across someone uh, who, oh my goodness, (laughs) really impressed me with a grip on what the real rules are and has the courage to share what those rules are, because as as we shared b- before the recording, they're going on for a lot of us. Uh, we've either experienced it ourselves, we've seen it happen to other people, but people just don't talk about it. So it's nice to have uh, a guest who's going to say a little bit of the quiet part out loud while we're <laughs> having a conversation today. So um, let's, let's, let's get right to it. As I tend to start these conversations off, I like to have an introduction of my guest by my guest uh, with a question like this. So who is Dr. Mercedes Jimenez? Who is Dr. Mercedes? Well, I want to first thank you for having me. Um, Who is Dr. Mercedes? Well, I'm trying to figure out that myself. (laughs) Um, An advocate, uh, a consultant, just a regular everyday person that's worked 21 years in the corporate workspaces, um, Fortune 500. And um, I've come out with different experiences. Um, It's made me who I am today. So uh, basically, I'm just like your average person. And I just talk about the experiences that I have. And I say the quiet part out loud. (laughs) Right, right. I I, that's, that's just so important. It really is. so what does psychological health and safety mean to you? When you hear those words, what does that mean to you? 
Well, it means that you should be able to say the quiet part out loud and not have to fear retaliation or repercussions. You should be able to be yourself without wondering, you know, somebody's in the background, you know, talking about you or they, they're putting these labels on you, specifically in the corporate landscape, in workspaces. Um, psychological safety is just, you know, being comfortable with who you are and being who you are, not having to change or code switch to please others or center others, center the comfort of others. So that's what I think of psychological safety. Uh, ab absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's a term that a lot of us <laughs> have either heard of, experienced, or had to do on occasion, that whole code switching thing, where you know, I am who I am, and then I go into an environment and I'm told, oh, yeah, we're hiring you for whatever reason, your set of skills, your background, your expertise, your education, your whatever. But we want you to do it this way. And we want you to say it this way. And I go, well, what if that really isn't me? Well, you kind of have to do it anyway if you want to stay. And that's really, really, really unfortunate. And I think that a lot of these organizations, I, well, I guess my wish is, is that they just come out and say that in the beginning. Why don't they just say up front, here's what the job really is. Here's what we really expect you to do, as opposed to all the neat things that are on the flyer and are talked about in the interview. And then when you get to the job, it's kind of different. So yeah, we're a little aggressive sometimes. We, you know, we, we bully people every now and then. We, <laughs> we might, you know, we might harass you on occasion. Uh, but I, I think if people said that, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, maybe it might not be so bad because people would know what they're getting themselves into. But uh, what motivated you to start talking about these kind of unwritten rules in the workplace? Well, as I said, I, you know, indicated I've been in corporate for 21 years. So walking in without the experience, without understanding there's a hidden world and you can walk on landmines and you have to be very careful and skilled. There's a game in there. It's a game. And it's either you play or be played, you know, and a lot of people don't want to be a part of the game, but you have no choice because you just got to figure out what the game is, how to identify the key players, where you are in the food chain, right? <laughs> and, you know, you just have to learn and you learn as you go. And when you come in, um, not knowing these things and you don't have mentors, you don't have sponsors, you know, you get into some trouble or you, you I mean, yeah, you, you get into situations where you think you're navigating the right way, but you're not. And it's just like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a whole different world. So understanding what I've walked into over these years and what I've experienced I started my channel because people honestly do not know, but I didn't realize how much they didn't know. But if you look at the numbers on my channel and if you look at all of the people and they're very transparent and I think they're transparent because they go under different names. It's not their real names. They don't have their real pictures up. So they basically are on there saying the quiet part out loud, or they're talking about what's happening to them. They're naming corporations. They're saying the names, but you know, they are anonymous. So they can do that safely. But you notice the people who have their names next to their profile, they're really, oh yeah, you know, they're really they're 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 very careful with their words. I'll say that. And then, yeah. I, I, it's really interesting that it, it sounds like you've actually created a safe space for people to share what's going on with them. I mean, they, they, if they could say it, to be quite honest, um, if people were having these wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful work environments and people were being treated with dignity and respect and, you know, and, and being uplifted and all that, uh, you might have to talk about other things. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you could do, but you probably have a whole different thing to talk about. But because this space has been created, and and again, I it just really amazes me that it is so different. You know that I, I to be honest, I think I was the same way when I got into the workforce. You know, a couple of years out of high school, 
I was thinking when people said these were the rules that they actually were. And I came to find out in some cases, even those of us who consider ourselves to be rule followers, well, nobody's following them except you. <laughs> you're the only one who's actually showing up on time. You're the one, only one who's actually turning in the work that you're asked to. And of course, you're not related to anybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. The rules are really different. And I talk about, I have different unwritten rules and I explain to people what they are. And I have created a safe space because I don't judge people and, you know, and I welcome people with all point of views. Um, People come on my page. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I don't shut them down because their opinions are different because you, you can't learn if you do that. If you want to be around people who only think like you, who look like you, who speak like you, that's what corporate's like. But I don't run my page like that, right? They want people, they want cultural fits instead of cultural ads. Like they want you to fit in these homogeneous cultures and they want you to think and feel and look and act the same way as the majority. And research has shown that when these those these homogeneous groups are not as successful as their those groups that are more diverse because diverse people bring different ideas to the table and that that was the problem that I was running into because when you come into corporate they say you know they welcome fresh ideas no they don't they do not a uh, unwritten rule you cannot be smarter than your boss you can't be. You, you you cannot be smarter than your boss. And even if you are smarter than your boss and you can't show it, that's part of the game. You have to play the game. If you're smarter than them, or they become threatened by you, then you're a target. That's what goes on in there. But you think, okay, I'm coming in here. I have some value to bring. I have something to offer. I have new, fresh ideas like you told me were welcomed. And then you come, you walk right into the trap and start giving those fresh ideas and perspectives and you become a target. Right. Right. Wow. 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 Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting discussion there uh, about in terms of whether or not you are, quote unquote, smarter or I, I, my question is, why wouldn't you want someone who is better at whatever it is than you are? Exactly, because they make you look good. They prop you up. I think it was, uh, who was it? Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, one of those guys. They always hired people that were smarter than them. So those smart people could tell them what to do, not the, not the less smart people tell him what to do. You know, he wanted people to tell him what to do so he could grow and get ideas. Like, so, but... It's too many egos in there and it's uh, cliquish, you know, that's another unwritten rule. You have cronyism and you have nepotism. People are getting promoted because they're a friend of a friend, not because they're skilled. And it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. I'm a doctor, but things weren't valid coming out of my mouth. But it was valid coming out of somebody else's mouth that didn't make it out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> really? And I'm saying, right. They really? would question me. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, in my field, I'm at the top of my field. I'm the expert in my field. I have proven myself. Right. They come in and IT, you can't fake it till you make it. Because the people sitting around the table who know what's going on. In the fit in, in in design in research, people who know what's going on knows when there's a faker among us. So you're talking like you know it, but you really don't. But the egos won't allow them to say, "Hey, I, I really don't understand this. Can you give me some guidance?" You'll you'll never learn that way. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. So, so you mentioned, and we talked about this again in the uh, our earlier conversation. When I so so when I saw you, I can't recall which one of your videos I saw first. 
And I went like, wow. I, again, quite part or loud, but it, it, I got the impression you were either a, um, either a senior HR person who really knows some deep stuff or you are a, a labor attorney and then come to find out that your doctorate is actually in IT and that, that these, what you're sharing is actually things that either you've experienced or you've seen go on in the organizations that you've been in. And I, I, I just find that amazing. I, I really do. I, I find that amazing because sometimes people are, particularly when they're really good at one particular thing, they find it difficult to share that with in other spaces. You, you know what I mean? So if they're an IT person, they're kind of heads down, you know, doing IT stuff and don't have a lot of conversations outside of that. And uh, so, so how do you, how do you decide what topics uh, that you focus on at a particular time? Is it just what you're feeling at the time, things that you've gotten from other people, a little bit of both? How, how do you come up with your inventory of, of topics? Well, my inbox is full. Um, I probably have at least 10,000 messages in there at any given time. And because I can't, I'm a consultant, I can't do one-on-ones by myself, 10,000 consult, you know, consultations. It's just impossible. And people have emergency situations, you know, in these different, you know, with these different companies. So some of my topics come out of my inbox, but a lot of these things I have experienced in these Fortune 500 companies, right? So I've seen it firsthand. I've experienced it firsthand. It is exhausting. It is totally exhausting. And, you know, like, for instance, I'm an introvert by nature, so I'm quiet. I'm not allowed to be an introvert. You know, I'm labeled as you think you're all that. You're angry. It's like you're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. If you talk too much. Oh, she talks too much. But if you're quiet, you have to be up to something. Now you're under this veil of suspicion. So it's just like, You just can't be who you are if you're going to succeed. And I know a lot of people in there now, you know, who have to play the game or code switch because they got families to feed. They have families to feed. Their back is against the wall. So early on, I pretty much knew that some of those some of those behaviors were not for me, you know, um, especially being late, like the way we speak right now, this is considered angry that you're, 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 you're labeled as aggressive. You're angry. You're these tags are put on you and it's just like, you can't, you know, it's just like, Oh God, really? I'm speaking the way I speak, but I have to speak the way somebody else speaks. Now I'll say I worked on a globally diverse team, I mean, globally dispersed, excuse me, meaning they're from different parts of the country. So the people in Kentucky talks like this. And then I remember one person came out and said something about people from New York, like being stereotypical. But what if we said you were ignorant because you come from Kentucky or your language is broken? Like, what is that all about? Why can't people just be who they are in the workspace? Why can't they come there in peace, do their work, get a paycheck and leave? You know, why can't, if you're quiet, why is it a problem? Why do I have to talk about what's going on personally with me around the water cooler? You you know, that's not what I'm there for. So there are like many unwritten rules that I talk about on my page, but I, there were a few, there are a few that I feel that are very important to my audience, definitely to my audience. There's a lot of women in there. It's a lot of women, a lot of marginalized people from different populations, but I have a disproportionate amount of people from every culture. I have Indian people, Chinese people, white people, black people, everybody, because it's not a race-based page. It's a problem-based page. We, we solve problems on there. We don't come to the table with race. So I have a little bit of everybody on there, but I know the prevailing attitude is 
HR is not your friend. That's a huge unwritten rule. Mm, mm, <laughs> HR mm. is not your friend. Say more about that. You say, so HR isn't your friend. What's a little, little mini course on that one? <laughs> well, people like if on on LinkedIn, of course. You have all these people in HR that they're impartial and, you know, we are um, uh, employee based and we care about our employees. That's bull. When you think of HR, you need to think about, you ever see the first 48? When it, Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So when they get you in a room and interrogate right. you, that's what you think about when you think about HR. See, they talk like this. You know, you can report a problem to them. And when you report a problem to them, they're not assessing, you know, they're looking at your problem. They're going to tell you, oh, well, we're investigating this. But the reality is they're assessing what type of risk you are at that point. Right. Is What kind of problem is it? Is it sexual harassment? Is it racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, pregnancy? retaliation, they're assessing what kind of problem it is, how serious it can become. And based on those factors, they start to manage you out. See, it's horrible that, and they present themselves like they're there to help you. But the bottom line is at the end of the day, I don't care what any of them say, at the end of the day, when it comes between you and them, they're there to protect the company, right? From you. They're not there to protect you from the company. So, and it becomes a balancing act, right? So based on the issues that you are reporting, they need to figure out how fast they need to get you out of there. (laughs) And what, 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 yeah, what, and they go through these processes. They create, you you know, there, there are books out there on that. They go through these processes to get you out and start managing you out because you know, you're a risk to the company, you're a risk to the company's bottom line, and they don't, they want to insulate the company from lawsuits. So when they say they're impartial, they're not. Every time they're going to come down on the side of the company, that's their role, you know, and now and t- it, people don't realize sometimes when they're reporting things to HR and they think they're talking to somebody from SHRM, but no, they're talking to attorneys. They have start hiring attorneys to, in HR as consultants. And that's who you're talking to. So you're not necessarily talking to Sherm representatives. You know, so they assess, yeah, and people don't understand the role of HR and how they are not your friend. And, you know, they are trained to be empathetic and they're trained to speak to you like this. And let me just, let me just, you know, tell me more, you know, and then they get behind the door and say, okay, this is what we got. Then they pull your employee file. (laughs) They want to know who was involved. They pull your employee file to see what your history was or is within the company. And the risk, if it's a manager, oh, they're going to start managing you out. They even have a whole process of managing you out. They have a way of making illegal terminations illegal. It's a whole strategy. I have, yes. So it's just like, that's the strategy I put on my page to let people know. Some places have the progressive termination, right? They'll start with a, 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 a written warning. Right. So what they'll do, let me back up, they'll manufacture a problem. And how they do that is you can have a star employee, but all of a sudden, after you report whatever it is you report, the discrimination, the retaliation, the sexual harassment, now they'll pile work on you. They'll pile work on you and tighten up the deadlines. And that is a setup for failure. So when you're not making your deadlines, then you get the the verbal warning, right? That's part of the, that that progressive termination. The second part is they will continue to pile. Then here comes the written warning, right? And the reason why they do this, this is like employee due process because they want to insulate themselves from the lawsuit and make it look legal. So when you get the written warning, then they're going to try to rehabilitate you and let let me give you a refresh and um, a course refreshing. You know, we're going to coach you through 
and then they pile more work on you. <laughs> okay. The work doesn't stop. The deadlines don't stop. And then here comes the pip, <laughs> the corrective action. Once you get the pip, well, we've done, you know, we've been working with you and, you know, you, you're going to have to make it through this pip, you know, and they'll lay out some parameters in the pip. The expectations will be almost impossible, especially on the 30 day pips. You get a 30 day pip. They're not trying to rehabilitate you. They're trying to get you out because the next step is you're not going to be able to make it the way it's set up. You're not going to be able to make it out of that pip. Not saying that's all, all the time, but most of the time, you know, so this is how they make these illegal terminations look legal. They take you through this process and then they have this paper trail. So I always tell people, document, 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 because they have defensive documentation on their side. You need to document on your side, because if you don't document, it's only one narrative on the record. Theirs. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish GX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy, www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. Right, right. There's, yes. So, so what if I, so uh, let's say I'm a new high school or college graduate, whichever one, and I'm just going out getting my first job. Uh, and I'm not related to f- anybody there. I'm, I do the application and do the thing. Are there a couple t- handful of things that s- some advice that you could give me as a you know new person going into what should I be looking for? I mean, is is should I get myself a mentor? I mean, just some quick thoughts about what I should do on the front end to try to protect myself. Well. I think you should, well, you study, read a lot of books on different culprit, co- uh, corporate, culprit, <laughs> different, <laughs> different cor- corporate cultures. You have to read a lot of books. If you don't know anybody on inside, um, it's going to be a little difficult. So I would say, you know, if you can get in through an internship, get in, um, the goal, the first 30, 60, 90 days is to start uh, networking carefully, um, make yourself known, go above and beyond, be helpful, you know, be polite. Um, those are the things that you should do. And as a matter of fact, I'm working with a client right now that I consult. And this is the exact situation in one of these big tech companies, he came in through an internship program and he is an engineer. So he was promised an engineering position after he completed the internship successfully. They threw him in a customer success position. What do you think is happening? Uh, probably not success. Out to yeah, not success. <laughs> not for him. <laughs> not, yeah. not success. He's, a, right. he's an engineer by trade. Right. So he came to me because he felt like my value is not being recognized. I'm not able to utilize my skills. Right. And I he goes to his team lead all the time, you know, to stay in the loop. He asked, he does ask a lot of questions and he, he has showed me, you know, the notes that he has just to inquire. OK, what am I doing right? You know, how do I do this? He's not afraid to ask questions. So then. He asked about the promise of getting him in a full-time position after he completed the internship. And guess what they did? They put him on a PIP. For asking. He didn't even see the PIP coming. Now, all of a sudden, the PIP had like a, a laundry list of things that were wrong, right? 
a laundry list of things that he never saw coming. He never got coached on any of these things. So he asked to speak. He met with HR, right? And his team lead because he had kept his team lead in the loop all the time. How about they compared the numbers for people who were trained for customer success as opposed to him just coming in and starting. The numbers were no different. The data was no different. He wasn't performing any different, but he's on the pip. So they're trying to manage him out because he's asking questions, trying to be a stand-up guy, trying to do the right thing. So I guess that was the long way of answering your question. What do you do? There's really no blueprint because these unwritten rules can bite you. And I know you said in the beginning something about, you know, the following the rules. Um, I think, you know, we had a, a talk before this about a nurse that I'm working with, right? The nurse, he said I could use his name and everything, but I will not. I would just talk about his situation, you know, because he's not here. So I will not use his name, but Here's the situation. He's a mandated reporter. He's he's an he's an RN. Okay. He works in a psychiatric, you know, he works in the ER, but there's a psychiatric ward in the ER. They bring a patient in. When they bring the patient in, two of the staff beat up the patient. He charts it. He goes and puts it in the chart. The charge nurse sees it. And like, okay, you know, you charted that right. After that, the next day, when I guess the charge nurse's manager, like the manager, I don't know, the head nurse or whatever his title was, all hell broke loose. He pulled my my um client in and he told him, you mind your effing business. Before you chart something, you come to me. So his license, you know, he didn't want his license to be on the line. And he's and he's totally confused because he's like, wait a minute. I'm a mandated reporter. I'm told to do the right thing. CMS came in and CMS came in, looked at his report and substantiated everything that he wrote. Now, mind you. After he was told to mind his effing business, they put him on administrative leave, paid administrative leave. He's the only one that was put on administrative leave, but the pe- the two employees that beat up the psychiatric patient were not. Right? So now they've just been totally harassing him and he has an attorney. He got an attorney. So... After CMS came in and substantiated all the claims, this hospital got fined seven figures. This just happened. This started in August and we're in January. This is still going on. Um, They got fined seven figures. And then they accused him of downloading 300 pages of uh, patient records and doing whatever. So he's like, Show me the breadcrumbs. Show me the footprints. We are in a technological age. If I downloaded that, you can show me. So, of course, his lawyer pounced right on that. And then they wrote, and I have a copy of all this. This not this is not word of mouth and him making up stuff because I don't. I mean, I'm not saying people lie, but I, I need to see something tangible. In the paperwork, they rescind it. And said, we made a mistake. No, you didn't make a mistake. You were trying to manage him out because he reported as a mandated reporter that you were beating up psych patients. And this is not the first time it happened. Um, If I'm a betting woman, I bet you this was not the first time that happened. So he's, you know, he's been on leave, administrative paid leave. And now that they got fined or whatever, now they're trying to bring them back. But This is another tactic that they use. They switched his whole schedule up. He's been working the same exact schedule for a year. Now, all of a sudden, it's opposite. And they know, you know, pretty much, you 
know what your employee, what hours your employees work and you're rotating them. Now they switch the schedule. So they're playing those little games. So of course the lawyer pushed back. Guess what they did? They re, re they uh put him back on his regular schedule. So I think, you know, I think you hit upon it in the beginning where you said, you know, you're told to follow these rules, but that's not the reality because he got in trouble for doing the right thing. And the people who beat the patient up, the two employees that beat the patient up, nothing happened. Wow. Wow. That, that, yeah. I, I heard once it's not the rules uh, that you, it's not the rules that you document that matter. It's the ones that you enforce. And cause you can write down all kinds of stuff. Oh, we have a policy for this and a policy for that. And here's the way we do things. But the ones you enforce are the ones that matter. And you can say all you want that, you know, we have a culture of caring and reporting and we, you know, we care for our folks and we, you know, we, if you see something come, if you see something, say something. But when some, when someone does see and say something, if they're treated in that way, that that unwritten rule about how we really treat you, people start hearing about that. Well, and, and there are a lot of organizations. And again, my you know background in occupational health and safety, you know, really reinforces this for me. Is that a lot of the physical and psychological injuries that happen are because of that culture? Because I saw it, I knew it was wrong, but I know it's not safe enough for me to say anything because the last person who said something. They're gone. Or the last person who said something, it was, you know, they got reduced in pay. Their, their hours got messed with. They got retaliated against. Something happened. So, again, it really doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you do and how you treat people when they actually do this reporting that they're supposed to report. Wow. 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 Yeah. And in his reports, like his initial reports were great because this is his second career. His first career, he was a police officer. Okay. Okay. So this so is they picked the wrong school. person this time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And yeah, he was a police officer turned nurse. Now he's an ER nurse. So, and here's another way these companies, these corporations escape accountability. Now they're trying to settle with him and get him to sign the NDA. They're trying to gag him. Right. And, you know, you have all these people out here pushing all these great initiatives and they look good on the commercials and everything. You know how many NDAs they have and how many settlement backroom settlements that they have settled out of court to keep people quiet. They've paid people because they've been abused and they've been retaliated against and bullied in the workplace. But yet they're out here with these squeaky clean reputations. And I always say like I read this book when I, I had got accepted into law school but somehow I ended up being a doctor I didn't pursue law school that's a long story but I read this book how do they sleep at night that's what it's called and I'm thinking how do these executives in these corporations sleep at night knowing how dirty they are <laughs> so I did a video on that to show people how to find out if the corporation that they are pursuing or working for has been sued. Oh. Yeah, I gave them a few resources in the video. This is how you find out if that corporation has been sued. Because there are backdoor ways to find out if they have been sued. It shows up in their financials. And that's public information. Hmm. <laughs> so. You, you know, I, I'll, uh, I'll add a resource. I don't know if you've heard of this one before. Have you heard of Culturama? So, so there is a website out there called Culturama. As a matter of fact, I spoke with one of the folks who set it up here recently. And Culturama takes the 1,500 or so. I think they've expanded that number to like maybe more than that by now. But they take the really large organizations in the company in the country and look at publicly accessible information, and they rate them in a bunch of areas to include uh, pay and you know legal status and all these different things that are going on in the company. So you can actually go out and do a background check on the company. Uh, and and I, I this is this is one of the things that I I believe that we should as individuals should do a better job if we're going to work with someone else, work under someone else's umbrella, the same way they're doing a background check on you, you should do a background check on them. 
because if there's a lot about that uh, about these cultures that they can't hide. They can't. They, they, as much as they try, they really can't hide it. But we have a, an example is this culture of, well, uh, their salaries, uh, their, their pay levels aren't visible and all that type of thing. Well, there's a reason that they don't want. Some states are now forcing these companies to do that. But if folks won't talk about that, I, I kind of wonder, why won't you talk about that? What, what's, what's that all about? Because they're afraid. I wrote a book. I just wrote a book, Rage Compression, right? And it addresses this very issue where you'll have somebody that's been in the company, experienced, skilled, or upskilled, and who knows the position, and then they're working for X amount of dollars. Then they'll bring a new hire from outside and pay them twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars more. Yes. In in my book, I tell people what to do in this type of situation. This is more common. If you go on my post, that one post has like 30,000 comments about this, you know, there's no reason why they don't even give retention bonuses in most cases, but they'll bring somebody from the street and pay them $50,000 more with less education. Oh yeah. Less education unskilled, and probably somebody's niece. <laughs> yeah, somebody's niece. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it's just like, it's you got a lot of that going on in there. It's like a dog eat dog world in corporate. And then, you, you know, People, they don't want to, when you go on LinkedIn, they want to talk about the nice, mushy rainbows and ch chocolate, <laughs> chocolate bars and, oh, this is just beautiful. No, it's not. No, it's not. And you know, it's not. Like if you go on my post, people on there will say, I worked in HR and I was told to set this employee up and I got fired because I said no. I mean, there these are people that I don't know these people. These and that's one thing about TikTok. They come in from around the world. I don't know third all these people. And I have a huge following. <laughs> yeah, so that's happening. And it's just like, how is that right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it's just like it's just so wrong on so many levels. How can you do that? They don't want people talking about salaries because under FL, FLSA, you can talk, discuss salaries in the workplace, but they make it taboo, right? <clears throat> and they have pretty much like gaslit employees into thinking that they should not discuss their salaries because that's private. No, what it is, is it opens it up for pay and equity. <laughs> you know, no, you can discuss your salaries. But the people who are making six and seven figures who should not be, who only have high school diplomas, right? <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. And the states should force, they should force uh, them to disclose, you know? And, and I agree with you on that point you talked about doing background checks on them. Because during the interviews, they'll ask you, you know, all these behavioral based questions. Right. And I, you know, they'll say, uh, if I, you know, contacted your previous employer, what would they tell me about you? No, the question is, if I contacted three of your previous employees, what will they tell me about you? Right. <laughs> That's the right. question. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I I, 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 I'm with you a hundred percent on that one. I, uh, so my, my graduate degree is in HR. I've never been a practitioner. Uh, I, I, so I, I know what I studied in school about HR and, and have been in positions overseeing HR people, all of that. But my challenge is, is to see these processes that have been put in place on the front end and in the back end, performance wise. F for example, why do you need to know the last six places that I worked? What, why does that matter? What, what, can I do the job that you're asking me to do? Do I have the knowledge, skill, and ability to do the job here? Because just because I did a great job at the last place doesn't mean I'll 
do a great job here. And the converse is true just because I did a horrible job there because it was just a terrible fit, but this will be a great fit for me. And I think we spend sometimes way much, uh, way, way too much effort on trying to go down these, you know, rabbit trails to find out, well, 12 years ago, they're on this job and they got a, you know, a pip and all this other type of thing. Well, but you, so did everybody else like me who spoke up about their, you know, discrimination and safety violations. And, and of course, so the company is able to cover their tracks by, by kicking people out. And that tarnishes them for the rest, sometimes the rest of their career. I, I, you know, I, and I think I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I was in an organization and I discovered uh, two occasions of federal tax evasion. And because I wouldn't go along with it, <laughs> uh, they, they uh, again, they just made it horrible until I left. They just made, made it horrible until I left. And, and so I, I, I relate to these situations where people are doing really, again, they're doing the thing that they were asked to do. They're following the rules, that the, the published ones. But again, all those little secret ones that nobody knew about are what's really going on. And again, I, I do think it's important that folks... Even when you start, is is do you know someone who works there? Is there any publicly available information about them? Find that out. Find that out before you go running in there going, oh, it's going to be wonderful. And then six months down the road, you're, you know, that that's a decision that you can make on the front end as, a, as an individual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And yeah, there, it's just, I don't understand, like, I don't know. It's just it, it, it's just strange in there sometimes. Right, right, right. So uh, I, as we you know start to to get to the conclusion of the conversation. So you said you wrote a book. Uh, tell tell me a little bit about the book writing. Is that your only book? Do you have multiple? Tell me more about your your writings. Well, I have uh, wage compression. I just wrote that book, and right now I'm writing the unwritten rules of corporate America. And I'm basically doing the research now, and I have tons of research, tons. And um, I'm gathering, and, and I'm just writing about these issues that I talk about on my page. Um, so that one I'm looking to release in April. But the wage compression just focuses on that because I saw there was a need for that. On one of the posts that I wrote, there was a need where people, you know, about the pay inequity. And then, you know, it was always there. But I think when all the prices start going up, inflation start hitting, it pinched a little harder. Right. And it's just like, you know, we can't, you know, everything is going up except our pay. That was the prevailing conversation. Everything is going up except our pay. But then you see the CEOs getting millions and millions of dollars in, in bonuses, right? But then you see layoffs of the same company. The CEO got the million dollar bonuses, but the layoffs, the people who make the company work. But right before Christmas, I did a video on that. And I'm just like, how disgusting. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it's just like, so, and I made a video and I said, everybody's not going to be rocking around the Christmas tree, unfortunately. You know, it, 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 it's just horrible. So that's one of those things. And I know I talked about in one of the unwritten rules about another way to get rid of people is through restructuring and layoffs. <laughs> Layoffs aren't what you're told they are all the time. They use those, they use that to escape legal liability. But that situation that you mentioned about them making that, you know, your atmosphere unbearable to, until you quit, right? Right. right. Constructive you know, discharge is what this, yeah, that, that's yeah, constructive yeah. dismissal is what yeah, yeah. that is. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you quit, if it's not a constructive dismissal, people don't realize that that even exists and they quit and then the company escapes all liability. Whereas they rather do that and make it life so unbearable in there where you just can't take no more and quit. 
And my message is don't do it. Right. Make right. them fire you. Right. Right. It won't be the first, won't be the last, right? Make make them fire you because then, you know, yes, yeah, it's, it's not as easy, but if they can make your life so unbearable in there, they will and people don't know, they'll just walk away and I believe that no one should sign up and go to a corporation whole and come out broken. It, that's why, I mean, so many people are bullied in there. You know, this is not my imagination. That's why you have the Workplace Psychological Safety Act, <laughs> right? Like all of these people have been bullied. You know, it, it's like a living hell in there. And I'm thinking... Isn't this your job? Like, not your job, but you just going there to work and, and leave and take care of your family? Sound like you're going walking into a jungle. <laughs> you know? It's it's crazy. Some of the things that, you know, and I'm reading all of this, and it's like some experiences, I'm just like, wow. And a lot of people on there, they're like, yeah well, we got a union, we got a union. So then you got the union people on there like, y'all need to get out of here. We have a union. <laughs> but we know what happened with the union, so. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, well, um, if, let, let's say there is someone who is uh, watching us on YouTube or listening to the podcast and they're going like, you know what? Uh, Dr. Mercedes has hit some, you know, she struck some chords and I, you know, I'm actually, I think I might want to give her a call and reach out to her myself. And if, if, if people really wanted to learn more about these topics, uh, why don't you share a little bit about, you know, how to contact you? Uh, please do share for those who aren't following you on TikTok and such, please. So share a little bit about how people can get a hold of you. They can come over to TikTok and follow the corporate clapback. So it's corporate clapback and just follow the page and they can come there, instant message me. Um, there are tons and hundreds of videos there where it's something for everyone, you know, um, that's where they can find me. And then, you know, right now I'm, I'm moving to you. Well, not moving, but building YouTube. Um, and you know, but that page on uh, TikTok, I really, I love TikTok because it's global. You have different people with different perspectives coming in, different countries because they tell you. And, you know, you'd be amazed at the benefits that the people from Germany, Australia, Italy, like their work-life balance is really balancing. <laughs> Not yeah. 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 Well, as I, you know, I, I share often, there are 30 countries around the world who have laws that require employers to do a better job uh, than they do here in the U.S. And uh, someday, you know, that that's really my hope that we shouldn't have to have a law. I mean, I, I think some people are there are slowly but surely I'm starting to run into people. Uh, starting to run into companies. They're generally smaller ones. They're going, look, we have to build a culture where people want to be here. We have to build a culture where people do feel psychologically and emotionally and physically safe. And as they're doing that, they're becoming the option for people. And these big and small companies who treat people like trash, I think they're going to slowly but surely start to fade away particularly because the Gen Zers and a lot of the, and even some you know folks in my generation are going like, you know what? I think I've had enough of that. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, whatever it takes, if I have to, you know, if I have to live in a van or, or live out in the woods someplace, I'd rather do that than be exposed to some of the trauma that's coming out of these organizations. So I, 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 I think it's getting better. I think it's getting better. Any, so anything you want to say in closing? Well, I want to thank you for having me. And, you know, it's definitely a pleasure to be on. But yeah, if anybody, you know, they want to talk, uh, read about some of the topics and the unwritten rules, I, I have like probably 40 up there. Come on over to my page, 40 and counting, you know. Wow. 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 Well, uh, Dr. Jimenez, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, this has just been really enjoyable for me to be able to have this conversation with you. 
And, uh, and you know, as usual, I, I, I learn from the folks that I have on these podcasts and, and it expands my just horizon and my view on things. Uh, and some days I think, wow, where was this back in the day? But thank God it's here now. So anyway, if if you're watching this episode on the Flourish DX YouTube page, please do like, subscribe, and share. If you're watching or listening to this podcast for the first time, welcome. I hope that something you've heard will bring you back in the future. Previous episodes of the podcast can be found at psychhealthandsafetyusa.com. Please do take time to uh, connect to us on LinkedIn and become a part of the Psych Health and Safety USA movement that we're at least trying to build. And uh, we'll look forward to our next conversation on the next episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Thanks very much for joining. Tune in each Friday for new episodes of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. If you have a story or know of one that needs to be told, reach out to us on LinkedIn or send an email to david at id2-solutions.com or go to the Flourish DX website at flourishdx.com. We'll see you next time.